Hey, welcome to Pondering Christianity. For those of you who are new here, welcome. And for those of you returning, welcome even more. Thank you for coming back. Um, for those of you who are new, Pondering Christianity is a channel where we attempt to simplify apologetics so that everybody can kind of get on board with the conversation. That being said, this week I'm going to give you guys my top five takeaways, all right, from the book Near-Death Experiences as Evidence for God and Heaven by Dr. J. Steve Miller. Um, and so what uh, we're going to get through this video, I'm going to give you guys my top five takeaways from the book. There was a lot of really, really good takeaways from this book, but uh, in particular, I wanted uh, to sum it up into, into my top five. Okay, so if you stick around, um, that's going to be what we go through to the, to the end of this video. If you want to see my number one pick, you got to go all the way to the end. So um, that being said, let's dive in. All right. Um, so the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is Dr. J. Steve Miller. Um, I don't know if I messed up his name there in the beginning. I was kind of moving fast. But uh, he has some amazing stuff in his book. It's a very good introductory book. Um, I really appreciate his ability to take these complex matters and bring them down to a language where everybody can kind of get on, get on board. And so um, it is a brief introduction, but he has a lot of different, um, he covers a lot of ground in a short period of time, I would say. Um, it's a lot of different thoughts, and that's something I really enjoyed about his approach, to be honest with you guys, is just how much he, he gave us. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's jump on in then. Uh, so uh, my number five, the number five takeaway, so this would be my ranked number five takeaway from the book. All right, is there is reports of NDEs being shared sometimes with those in the room. Okay, this is a really interesting component because that means that not only are the people who are experiencing um, the near death experience, there are other people in the room that are also experiencing this near death experience with them, or at least some elements of it. Obviously, they're not going through the entire experience with them, but they are going through some of the elements with them. And so that, that's a really intriguing thing of seeing this, this portal, if you will, opening up, people going through it, and, and you just know kind of like, well, what was that? Um, so there's definitely a supernatural component to it. Um, so page, page 66, I wanted to bring this quote right in off the book. Often those who are near relationally or physically, the dying, share the NDE. These reports are evident, evidentially valuable in that several people may independently report and corroborate the experience. Additionally, these reports can't likely be explained by naturalistic explanations such as the dying brain hypothesis since those sharing the experience were not in the process of dying. Neither were they suffering from oxygen deprivation, hyper, hyper car, carbia, <laughs> fear of personal death, or other symptoms that may influence the brain and death. So all this to say that you can't invalidate that experience or what that person's testimony is that eyewitness testimony is simply by trying to have a physiological explanation for what's going on um, so obviously if if other people are seeing these experiences happen then there's a lot more validity to the experience happening right eyewitness testimony is stronger the more of it that we have and especially when that's reliable eyewitness testimony okay number four my number four takeaway they sh um, was NDEs beginning and end are strikingly similar to real experiences. Let me expand on this. Expand on this a little bit. What I mean by that is quite simply, someone's near death experience, and, and or rather an NDE versus like a dream or hallucination. A dream or hallucination does not have just. It, it doesn't have a seamless ending, right? Like it's an abrupt ending. You're, you're in the middle of falling, getting attacked, uh, something exciting is about to happen right like dreams don't have a ending or beginning that really makes sense okay and i think we've all experienced this through, through our own dreams so with that being said ndes are different in the sense that there there seems to be a timeline of the person goes into a state of death here on on the physical plane with us and then uh, presumably in the spiritual plane their nde is beginning and so there's a tie to the beginning of it there. It just doesn't begin randomly. It begins when their death is occurring here on this plane. And then the ending of their NDEs, this is especially interesting to me, is that the, the ending seems to always come after they have a conversation or learn something or, or someone tells them something or they just know that it's coming to an end. And so this level of awareness that they share, in addition to the consciousness that they have in these experiences, 
I think is also something that um, is worthwhile uh, to, to pay attention to. So it's, it's that structure of having a beginning and having an ending that is, that is really intriguing when you're looking at the actual format of a near-death experience when compared to, say, a dream or a hallucination. Okay, um, so they should end uh, when we wake or return to reality, regardless of where they are in the storyline, because dreams aren't time to end when we wake. Okay, so this is uh, this is Dr. Miller speaking here, and uh, he's saying simply that he's he's referring to the fact that they should end when we wake or return to reality. That is saying a coherent explanation for a near death experience, if it is in fact happening and it is reality. They should end when we wake or return to reality, regardless of we are in the, where we are in the storyline, because dreams aren't time to end when we wake. Um, if if NDEs were either dreams or hallucinations, wouldn't we expect them to end abruptly when sedation is discontinued or when the heartbeat is restored? Yeah, I apologize there. I was saying something a little bit out of context, but basically, he's you can you can see he's, that's why I included this entire quote from the book. He's clearly explaining um, that. If NDEs were either dreams or hallucinations, wouldn't we expect them to end abruptly? As soon as the sedation was up, that person would no longer be experiencing that NDE. Um, it would be interrupted if it was simply a dream or hallucination. Um, yet NDEs bear more resemblance to movie endings than dream endings in the sense that they have closure. Uh, th these people are getting a conversation. They're getting closure from these conversations. So they come back to this life with uh, a greater level of learning, have, have uh, felt a level of closure or acceptance or love from the experience itself. So that's my number four. Moving on up. Number three, most researchers aren't starting with presupposed positions. And let me explain on this. So presupposition is basically going after an idea with a stance of nothing else could be possible. Um, allow me to explain. If, for example, I want to go study near-death experiences, okay? Now, if I go into the near-death experience with a presupposed position that God is, in fact, the, re the cause of it, and I'm just going into the research to validate that and find links back to that, that's not a very good way to conduct research or to con con conduct an investigation at all. So in order for me to be able to go into this investigation as open-minded as possible, then I need to go into these investigations with the idea that, okay, either God could be causing these things or there could be some kind of feel physiological um, kind of cocktail, if you will, um, that's making this happen or some type of formula. I wouldn't necessarily have a, um, a, I wouldn't have a good process for trying to determine what's true or not. If I'm simply looking for that which co-aligns with what I've already presupposed before beginning my investigation. So this is why presupposition is of importance because it does add validity to what someone's doing. Like, for example, if an atheist goes in to study NDEs, and then when they get to the end of it, they say, I'm now a believer in the spiritual world, or the spiritual realm, or whatever they want to say, God, what, whatever, um, then that has a lot more validity than a Christian going in and saying, hey, this just confirmed what I knew this whole time, that Christianity is true. And so that adds a lot of validity to the study, to the people conducting the study, because it allows us to look through the lens of a skeptic as opposed to someone who's just simply trying to confirm what they already believe. Okay? Um, so uh, a couple, couple quotes from the book on this one. Uh, page 38, according to Dr. Bruce Grayson, professor of psychiatry and neurobehavioral sciences at the University of Virginia and on the most respected excuse me, one of the most respected researchers in the field, most near-death researchers did not go into their investigation with a belief in mind-body separation, meaning that they thought the mind and the body, the mind and the brain specifically, were one. You did not separate the two from one another, but came to that hypothesis based on what their research found. So they came in believing that the mind and the brain were one, and then walked away believing that the brain was perhaps a computer or a filter or some kind of system that was allowing the mind to integrate with this realm. Um, now, page 139, while researchers such as Moody, Saboom, I'm so sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, and Van Lommel also began their studies with a naturalistic bias, uh, their exposure to NDEs caused them to question that paradigm. That's what you want to see. You want to see people who are skeptic going in, investigating, finding information that would call into question the stance that they had previously, 
and then questioning that stance because the evidence is so strong that it actually causes the, causes the stance to come be called into question. So that's exactly what we want from, from these um, investigations. That, that lends a lot of validity to what's coming out of it versus if they go in and they're like, yeah, confirm the whole time uh, that it wasn't happening <laughs> because it's not a, uh, there's no natural explanation for it. Then of course that's kind of uh, that's boring I think, um, but but it's also not it's not um, intellectually being honest I think you're you're getting to the point where you're not respecting what the evidence has to say you're just simply dis dismissing it as there is no natural explanation for it so therefore there's no reason to investigate it further. Um, and and to be honest of of the skepticism I've seen in the scholarly um, literature the the people that have that level of skepticism are presupposing um, a natural position. So they're assuming that NDEs are not, there's no possible way for them to be spiritual as there is no such thing as a spiritual experience or a spiritual realm or soul or anything like that. So that presupposition always causes them to, to achieve this, this idea that, of course, there, there's no such thing as an NDE. So, um, okay, so number two. Uh, it's a small quote, but I think a pretty large one. NDE research has taken leaps and bounds since its formal discovery in the, uh, the 1970s. So, and, and here, I'll just read the quote to you guys real quick off of page 106. Actually, over the past few decades, over 55 researchers uh, or, or over 55 researchers or teams have published over 65 studies of over 3,500 NDEs. And this was in 2012 that this book was written. So you know that the the research has, has grown dramatically since then. I mean, the research for NDEs really started in the 70s and then has now began picking up speed, picking up speed, picking up speed as more and more of this literature comes out, more and more people become familiar with it and they're comfortable dis disclosing their experience. But something of, of uh, I think, interest is that, well, if you wanted to be a skeptic of it, you would just simply point to the lack of evidence, right? You'd be like, look at, look at all this evidence that it's missing. This is, this is fairly new. But we're starting to get to the, in my opinion, we're starting to get to that tipping point where you're starting to have enough evidence start to show up that it's now becoming a, a discussion for people to seriously consider. And so I'm going to give you guys a prediction right now, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to try to foresee into the future and give you a prediction. I think that NDEs in the next 10 years will be one of the foremost topics in apologetic arenas. Um, I think that they're going to become a heavily uh, debated topic. I think it's going to become something um, of uh, kind of a lot of contention between the two sides because of how strong the evidence is coming back from it. Originally, it's easy to just simply disregard a uh, near-death experience by saying, oh, well, you know, they were hallucinating. That was cool. Pat them on the head, send them on their way. And that person feels stupid. So why are they going to share their experience? I mean, it's anecdotal. It's easy to just kind of write it off. But the thing is, is if you get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of witnesses who are saying that this has happened to them, who are coming forward and giving their stories and, and we're seeing common elements, you have to suddenly start to take into consideration that maybe it's true, right? Like I personally don't believe in aliens, but if five people told me they saw an alien, I'd be skeptical. If 50, I'd be like, okay, that, that probably needs to have some level of investigation a hundred okay now i'm really curious a thousand okay five thousand ten thousand so on and so forth until you're just like how many more eyewitnesses do you need to see the alien before you're going to take their word for it and say man i'm pretty sure aliens exist i mean i've seen a lot of reports talk about it so there comes to a point where you have to continue to raise that bar of skepticism um, which atheism is so famous for doing to get to this point of saying okay when will that tip over and be enough for you to consider that it actually happened, right? How much eyewitness testimony do you need before you can believe something or, you know, study history, for example? I think, I think that's something of, of note. <laughs> okay, so my number one, my number one observation from this book, okay? Page 36, but now we know that atoms aren't solid. 
In fact, they're 99.999% empty space. And even the parts of the atom wandering around in all that empty space aren't really solid. We've never seen electrons with our eyes, even after our most powerful visual microscopes magnify them. We see their effects so that we know that they exist, but we have difficulty figuring out precisely what they are. We know that they're there, but we can't know that we can't know their exact location when we're not observing them. In fact, scientists have strong evidence that electrons don't actually have uh, a location until they're observed. In their essence, they seem to be more like invisible waves than observable particles, yet their activities affect what we call physical things. So I wanted to read that quote before you before making my, my number one like takeaway from the book, the universe isn't as solid as it appears. Now, this gets into like quantum mechanics, quantum, quantum physics, all, all kinds of really um, complicated studies that uh, I don't really feel super confident discussing currently. Um, but that being said, I have noted, um, as a matter of fact, I just finished Proof of Heaven by Eben Alexander, and he even is discussing the, the idea that there, there's this growing level of understanding that the universe isn't all physical matter. There, there's kind of this, this essence, if, if you will, I, and forgive me if that's not the correct term, but there's this kind of this, this essence that uh is is creating these atoms that we see right but it's like when you zoom into that right then you zoom into that it kind of reminds me of the kid that you you answer the question right and they give you a why well why is it that way right oh well you know we have to we have to pay money like this because it's that's the way it's done well why is it done that way well if you know right you explain to the kid well it's done this way because of this and then they go well, why is that the reason that we do it that way, right? And they just keep asking why, 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 why? Well, we're kind of like, you know, scientists are kind of like that kid um, where they keep asking why, keep asking why, and they dig down further and dig down further and dig down further and dig down further. And then you dig down so far that you actually find out that there is all this empty space that makes up these things that we supposedly think are solid material, right? Because we can touch them, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem to look that way the further we go into... Um, quantum physics and, and quantum mechanics and our understanding that things aren't quite as they appear when you go deep, deep, deep down. Um, and, and he included, these are, these are quotes out of the book um, that are quotes of obviously other famous scientists that he included, uh, but I just thought they were so cool that I would add them on here of just kind of something to get you thinking um, about how science can possibly um, possibly lead us to eventually discovering the soul in some way shape or form um so something of interest or at least getting a, getting us closer to having more scientific evidence to say something like that okay uh so groundbreaking uh physicist werner heisenberg put it this way um i'm from albuquerque so that name has a special meaning to me uh, atoms are not things the the electrons which form an atom shells <clears throat> are no longer things in the sense of classical physics things which could be ambiguously described by concepts like location, velocity, energy, size. When we get down to the atomic level, the objective world in space and time no longer exists, and the mathematical symbols of the theoretical physics refer merely to possibilities, not to facts. So Heisenberg here is making the observation that although we might have all of this fancy mathematical and physics jargon referring to the behavior of these laws, we don't quite have a way to grab hold of them, right? Kind of like gravity, for example. I can drop my microphone right here. I could drop this microphone and see the effects of gravity. However, I wouldn't see, you know, fields of, of like energy fields coming up and grabbing the microphone and then pulling it down to the center of the earth. Um, so that's... That's kind of like what, to me, he is alluding there to. Um, okay, and then uh, another one, and I, I personally really like this quote a little bit more, was the revered Cambridge and Princeton mathematician and physicist James Jean wrote this. The stream of knowledge is heading toward a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a machine. My, uh, than like, blah, blah, blah. Mind no longer appears Oh, there we go. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder. 
into the realm of matter, we ought rather to hail it as the governor of the realm of matter. We ought rather to hail it as the governor of the realm of matter. The universe isn't as solid as it appears, right? The, the thinking, the mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We ought rather to hail it as the governor of the realm of matter. That, that is really um, an insightful thing for someone to say, right? Especially someone who's a scientist with a career on the line um, to be saying something along those lines. So uh, I think that uh, it does beg the question. It does beg the question of where in the world is this um, thinking taking us? You know, where where will this end up taking us? Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, that's got to be the largest mind bending component out of the out of the book. Now, this book is excellent. Uh, here, I'll show it to you guys real quick. Um, here's what it looks like. Um, great, great read. Like I said, uh, it, it has a lot of appendixes on um, different kind of, I, I would say, oddball topics when it comes to near-death experiences. Uh, for instance, like Bible verses, um, different elements, critiques from, from uh, like Dr. Susan Blackmore. It has a lot of other really good elements to it that um, shine light on, on multiple fields of, of near-death experiences. And so if, if, you are guy, if you guys are really wanting to get an introductory book for near-death experiences, it's, it's, that's the best one I would recommend so far uh, for the reasons that I've mentioned. Okay. All right. That's uh, this week's video. Um, so a couple things here. Now, closing up, um, subscribe and watch. If you guys want to help me out, the biggest and most helpful thing you can do for me right now is to just hit that subscribe button and watch some of the other videos on the channel and then engage, comment, all that good stuff. But those are the two main things you guys can do right now to help me out is subscribe and watch more of the videos. Um, also, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, Freedom Church in Los Alamos. They were so kind as to uh, give me a gift and that allowed me to procure this awesome, uh, huge banner and uh, the lighting that I'm using now to uh, illuminate my face a little bit better so I don't have to use the natural light. So um, thank you so much for that gift, guys. God bless you. Um, it's a massive help, and uh, I'm excited to, to continue to do more, to bring more to the channel, bringing you guys content and value. Um, so do me a favor. If you like the video, comment below. What was your favorite part? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Um, and big news um, that next potentially next week or the week after, I will actually have the author of that book, Dr. Uh, J. Steve Miller. Um, we're in communication now to set up an interview. So I'm pretty pumped about that, guys. Um, I hope you are too. It's uh, it's going to be an insightful conversation. We're going to talk a lot, um, about near-death experiences specifically and as they relate to apologetics and see how far in we can go on that conversation. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, in the meantime, I will uh, see you guys next week. Keep on pondering.